Well, life tends to work out weird sometimes. I have never been able to downplay, and it was, I don't know, four years ago, maybe five years ago, for Mother's Day, I preached an entire sermon on hell. <laughs> and uh, we're going through the text. And if you looked, Luke 4, and I, I honestly told myself, I'm not going to be preaching on hell for, uh, for Mother's Day, and, and thank goodness I'm not. Instead, I'm going to be preaching on Satan. <laughs> That's what you get for not preaching a lot of topical messages. We're just going along, and this is what the text has for us today, so we're going we're gonna to go with it. Uh, today is Jesus versus Satan, subtitled, The Devil is a Punk. Jesus versus Satan in it. If you, if anybody who's into superhero movies maybe has seen the preview for Batman versus Superman, and and Batman's down there, he's got his glowing eyes. Superman's floating up there, and Batman says, "Do you bleed? You will, you know." Uh, this is uh, this is lots bigger than that. This is on a cosmic scale, and the and the stakes are are huge. The stakes are our usefulness to God, and uh, the salvation of people's souls. How many people here know that Jesus is greater than Satan? Yeah? All right. See, it's not, it's not, a, uh, it's, it's not like a yin-yang situation where you've got God on one side and the devil on the other side, light and dark. Uh, C.S. Lewis gave this perfect illustration. He said, if the forces of good and evil were perfectly balanced, it'd be like two equally powerful men pushing on a big boulder. The boulder doesn't go back and forth eternally. The boulder just sits there. It doesn't move if they're equally powerful. The very fact that we have creation, that, that we, fact we have love and light and goodness, all these things, the devil can try to taint those, but the fact that they exist shows that logically, philosophically, darkness is not as strong as light. Uh, evil is not the opposite of, of goodness. Evil is not the opposite of goodness. Evil is just a warping. I was going to say warpitation, but I'm not sure that's a word. It's just the warping of goodness. Uh, it's, it's like a, a broken stick, right? You can have a stick that's not broken. There doesn't have to exist such a thing as a broken stick. But for a broken stick to exist, you first need to have a straight stick. You need to have a, a, a whole stick. Same with a lie. You don't, lies do not need to exist. The possibility of lies do. If there's truth can exist all on its own, but all, like all wickedness, it's dependent on goodness for its own existence. For a lie to exist, there has to first be truth. So there is no yin and yang. There is no balance between this. There, there is no death without there first being life. There can be life without death, but death can't exist without life. So get that out of your head that there's these two equally balanced forces. That's a myth. It's not true in the Bible at all, but it's also not true logically. It just doesn't make any sense. So when we talk about Jesus versus Satan, we're talking about the Son of God, the creator of all things, and Satan According to scriptures, it's a created being. He's a fallen angel. So he's not the same as the creator. There's, uh, there's really no comparison between the two. But how many people know that Jesus, when he was made flesh, that Jesus, when he was a human being and weakened with hunger, was still stronger than Satan? Luke is once again today introducing us to who Jesus is. Who is Jesus, and why is Luke spending these chapters telling us who Jesus is? Because if Jesus is truly God, and he came down into our messed up world, and God sees your hurt, and he sees your sin, and he, he wants to do something about it, if this is true, then nothing else is the same. In fact, nothing else compares, nothing else matters in comparison to this. Brothers and sisters, I believe that God loves you. I believe that he just didn't turn his back on all our messed up ways. He came down in person. And, and, and uh, Jesus Christ is here because God just didn't write us off. Well, they messed up. Well, they've screwed up too many times. Well, they've, they've got too much sin, so I don't love them anymore. That's not the way God works. Sometimes we do that, you know, human love. Well, they've, that was the last straw, or they've done that too many, one too many times, but that's not the way God is. God loves us, 
And so he came in person to do something about this. And Luke is introducing Jesus to us so that the cross makes sense. We have to know who this man is. And we will see that Jesus, even as a weakened, putting on flesh, the Bible says he set aside his glory when he became human being. He set aside his glory. Uh, he went from all the prerogatives of, of being God, all, all, the, all the wonder of being in heaven. He came down. He was born in a stable. He was humble. He came to live life just like you and I, beside you and I. And this Jesus, who has set aside all his glory, put on flesh, uh, well, he's weakened by hunger, still defeats Satan. He resists temptation. Now, I've noticed something in my life. When I'm weary, when I'm hungry, when uh, life seems to not be going my way, I can be an irritable person. That I'm not saying this to, like, I'm proud of it. I'm not saying this like, uh, like, well, I'm an irritable person to deal with it. No, no, it's to my shame. It's not good. Uh, that's, I've noticed in my life when, when I'm tired and worn out, it's harder to resist temptation. Has anybody else noticed that? So Jesus Christ resists temptation at the end of a 40-day fast. Now, I want you to think what's going on here. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the new Adam, the sinless. Adam was created without sin, right? But when temptation came and the devil came and he kind of twisted God's words, Adam fell. Jesus, as the new Adam, resists temptation, unlike Adam and Eve. And Jesus does not rebel against God while he's in the wilderness, unlike the nation of Israel. So Luke is showing us this is a, a real event. How do we know this happened? There's no Mary here. There's, no, there's none of the apostles here. This is what Jesus shared. This is what the Holy Spirit then shared to the author of Luke. Jesus representing Israel, representing Adam, the human race, resists temptation in exactly the same context in which humanity was shown to fail again and again and again. We have failed. We don't measure up. The cross, what does the cross mean? Cross is, is like, it's like a neon light, you know, flashing in the darkness. Flashing in history, it says you and I can't cut it. Let's just be honest with ourselves. We're not sinless. We're not all that. We're not perfect. Amen, right? We know that. If we could be good enough to go to heaven because, yeah, I'm pretty good, do you think Jesus would have wasted his time suffering and dying for our sins? The fact that there's a cross means we couldn't make it on our own. And that's why, that's why God did it for us, because he loves us. So what is salvation? Well, what is grace? It's unmerited favor. It means we don't deserve it. God loves us anyways, even though we don't deserve it. And so this cross tells us that where humanity has failed, Jesus, who was sinless, was able to give his life as a representative of humanity, the same way Adam represented us at the beginning, and brought us into sin. Jesus represents us at the end, and he dies for our sins so that we can have a new life, forgiveness of sins. Uh, Jesus fasted 40 days, and this is a number that's, there's a lot of Old Testament stories where it's 40 days and 40 nights or, or 40 years in the wilderness or whatnot. So 40 is a highly symbolic number in the Old Testament. But have you ever thought that 40 days without food is impossible? that he had to be cheating. You know, he used a little bit of the God power on that one. Uh, 40, 40, you know, if he did it, that would be perfectly fine with me. <laughs> I'm not going to call God a cheater. He can do what he wants. Uh, he didn't say he didn't use God's power, so it wouldn't be deceptive. But I always wondered, 40 days, that's just, the only way he could do that is because he was God in flesh. Uh, he must have used some of his divine power to keep himself going. But it turns out, because I, I was talking with a, another pastor in our Great Commission movement, and, and uh, I'm not a big faster. Because of other pastors, I've been with them and pasted, uh, fasted three or four days, and that was probably easier than I thought. But uh, talking to another pastor, he, he went a couple weeks. And uh, so I started researching online. In the 1980s, 10 Irishmen were engaged in a hunger strike against the British presence in Northern Ireland, and these, well, a number of Irish people were engaged in the hunger strike, but 10 of them died 
between 46 and the last one died 73 days. So all 10 of these made it longer than Jesus did without any food at all. And research on the internet, uh, reasonably, anybody can die a few days without food because your heart doesn't adjust well. But a reasonably healthy person should be expected to survive three weeks or 21 days without food. Who would have known? Who wants to know? <laughs> I, Lord, I don't want to ever have to know. Uh, water is a totally different subject. People die usually after three days without water, and the reason is your inside gets so hot, you get feverish and, and your, your organs shut down uh, because of heat generated. Water, we need water to cool us. Uh, some people have gone up to 10 days that's been verified and recorded, but it's very rare. But Jesus was able to fast for 40 days, and there are people alive in the world today who have done, done that. But imagine, what do you do when you don't get what you want? What do you do when life doesn't go the way you want? Well, I wanted this relationship to work out this way. I want a dinner at 6 o'clock. It's 6.15, for goodness sake. What do we do when the boss does not appreciate us? I've been in a situation where I went out of my way to do an extra good job, and the boss complimented somebody else for it, and I'm sitting there. What do you do then? What do you do when you really, really want something, and you're saving up and trying to do it right? And some Yahoo lucks into a good job, right? And he gets it right away, like he pre-orders it. You've been waiting years. How do we feel when we're deprived? How do we feel like physically, emotionally? Things that we desire, and they don't go our way. Don't you feel like you have a right to be vindictive? Have you ever felt like, I've got a right? They, these people mess me over too many times. I've got a right to dot, dot, dot. Well, this is unjust. I've got a right to dot, dot, dot. Well, I want to say something difficult. If you're not a Christian yet, become one. <laughs> if you are a Christian, yeah, see how simple that is? If you, if you are a Christian, meaning you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you've accepted his work on the cross, you said, Jesus, forgive me, I want into your family, I, I want forgiveness, I want eternal life. If that's what you've done and you're now a believer, guess what? You've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't own yourself. You gave up your right to vengeance. You gave up your right to vindictiveness. You gave up your right to pout. You gave up your right to be irritable. You gave up your right to be a pain because somebody else did. No, we don't have that right. Now Jesus owns us, and he has a way that he expects his children to behave. Does that make sense? And, you know, that's a huge relief because then I don't have to be the cop anymore. I don't have to make them pay. Jesus said, vengeance is mine. He forgave me of so much. Now my job is to turn around and learn how to forgive other people that have let me down, that have not been what I thought, expected, hoped they would be. But you know what? I can't fight Satan. I'm a pastor. I was a missionary for eight and a half years. Sometimes I feel like I make Satan's job so easy. It's not even like there's a titanic struggle between Pastor Dan and Satan. No, it's just, here, roll over. <laughs> you know how dogs do that, roll over, Satan wins? That's, I mixed my illustration there. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> dogs, dogs roll over, Satan wins. You know what I'm talking about when a dog gives up in the fight? I... I, and it's not just me, nobody in this room has the power to stand with Satan toe to toe. We cannot, as, as the old hymn would say, our fighting would be losing. A mighty fortress is our God, right? The book of Jude tells us that even Michael the archangel, this mighty, powerful, beautiful angel of God, he didn't rail against Satan. He didn't, he didn't shake his fist in, in Satan's face. He didn't cuss out Satan. Instead, he said, the Lord rebuke you. Michael was standing behind the power of God. 
and we stand up. The Bible says, resist Satan, and he will flee from you. The key is we're resisting him in the power of Jesus Christ, not in our own strength. Not in our own strength. So when I say the devil is a punk, I'm not saying that is, oh, he's some punk, you know. No. I'm saying that he tried to punk Jesus. The devil is a liar. He's a trickster. He, the Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. He wants to destroy your, your family. He wants to destroy your church. He wants to take away your joy. He wants to take away your peace. If you're not a Christian, he's going to stand right between you and God and make it hard for you to find him. He does not want you to go to heaven because guess what? He can't even hurt God. He doesn't, even, he doesn't have a slingshot big enough to, to wound God. But he knows because God loves that every person he can snatch away from God and keep in hell, that wounds God's heart. So he wants to hurt God by grabbing as many people as he can. Well, don't let him do that. Put your faith in Jesus. If you're not going to trust Jesus, who are you going to trust, right? But if you are a Christian, what Satan wants to do is take away your peace, your joy, your ability to do ministry, your closeness to God. He doesn't want you to enjoy your Savior. He doesn't want you and Jesus to be tight and going through the day, eating together, walking together, talking together. He doesn't want you to pray. He doesn't want you at church. He does not want you at Bible study. The devil wants you, okay, fine, you're saved. You're going to go to heaven? But why don't you just go sit in the corner, sit down, shut up, don't talk about your faith, wither away, suck air, go to the bathroom, Keep doing that, repeat, repeat, repeat till you're dead. I can't, I can't pull you out of Christ's hands. Jesus said, all whom the Father has given me, not one will be lose my hand. I, he said, I can't pull you from his hand, but maybe I can make you worthless. Maybe I can make you miserable. Maybe I can make your life not count. Jesus wants to un, uh, undo all the work of Satan. Uh, Jesus came to steal from the strong man. Remember, he said, I steal from the strong man. I plunder his house. You know, Jesus is macho. Jesus in, God invented cool. So Satan has all the plunder. He's out, out all the people that he's lying this evening in his home. And Jesus says, I'm the one who can break into the strong man's house, Satan, and steal his stuff, which is his stuff is you and me. He makes us trophies of grace. So not even Michael the archangel uh, mocks the devil but uh, be, with the power of the Lord, uh, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Get out of our families. Get out of our church. We don't want you. You've got nothing to offer us, nothing good. We're going to see today Jesus combat the devil, and he does it in a very interesting way with Scripture. Now, why does Jesus need to quote Scripture? He's God, right? Well, let's keep in mind when he's quoting Scripture, he's quoting himself, which is okay to do, right? Why would Jesus use the Bible? Because it's his word. And because it's true. And Satan always comes at us with lies. He wants to twist the truth because we react to what we believe is true. Ideas matter. And what you believe is true affects how you think and how you act and what you say. And so G that Jesus wants to bring the truth to bear and Satan wants to twist the truth. And Jesus also is giving us a pattern for defeating temptation in our own life. And we don't defeat... Jesus didn't do one thing to defeat temptation for the rest of his life. Each time temptation rose, he brought scripture to bear. Brothers and sisters, if you struggle with anger, don't say, I've, this is overwhelming, I can't do this. You struggle with lust, don't say, this is overwhelming, I can't do this. In the moment, day by day, step by step, right here, say, I want to give this victory to Jesus because I don't want to please Satan. And at that moment, say, I'm going to bite my tongue because all that's going to come out right now is going to please Satan and it's going to hurt the heart of my loving Savior. I want to live your way, Lord, moment by moment. So Jesus shows us, it's not a, you know, the, the easy button from Staples, push it. Now I don't have to worry about my messed up sin anymore. But step by step, when temptation arises, we bring the truth to bear and we honor the Lord in each moment. So Jesus is giving us a pattern for dealing with temptation. But there's something way more important than us uh, dealing with temptation that's going on. We're seeing this titanic battle and again, the stakes are high. This is a battle for human souls. C.S. Lewis, again, said something beautiful. He said, you don't have a soul. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. 
Isn't that an interesting way of thinking about it? When, when, we, when we die, and you've all experienced this, we go to the funeral home, we see our loved one there, we know that's a shell. That's not our loved one, that's the shell. Our loved one is with the Lord. Our loved ones that have put their faith in Jesus Christ. You are not a body, you are a soul that owns a body. And uh, we're made to be, by the way. We're not like the angels that are just spirit. Uh, yes, we'll go to heaven now, but God's plan is to create a new heavens and a new earth, and he's going to give us new bodies because we're not like animals that are just physical. We're not like angels that are just spiritual. We're something special and different. We're made in the image of God, and we're made to have flesh and blood and spirit. And so we will go to heaven, but that's not the end of the story. We're waiting then for our new bodies where we can enjoy the new earth. Jesus knew all this, and he valued his relationship with his heavenly father, listen, more than food. What do we allow us to knock us off our walk spiritually? I value a nice drive without some guy cutting me off. So now I have the right to be, wait a second, I'm not acting like Jesus. I'm hungry, therefore I have the right to, no, no, no. Jesus valued his relationship with his father more than food, more than stuff. So what happens if we lose our stuff? Are we going to say, oh, Lord, why did this happen to me? I'm a, your follower. Now I'm out of here. That would mean we value our stuff more than we value God. Brothers and sisters, this is hard for me. What are we putting above God so that if, we're deprived of it, we feel like we have a right to be angry with God and treat other people badly. Because we're just pawns of Satan at that point, and I've been there more times than I want to admit. This is, my heart is to be a blessing to you guys, not a curse. But that doesn't come easy. Not because of you guys, because of me. I know how to be a curse. It comes easy for me. I don't even need to work on that. I don't even have to work on that. It just comes easy. Jesus was not a materialist. He valued things that can't be seen, things that can't be measured. Ravi Zacharias put it this way, materialism dictates that all that ultimately matters is matter. Materialism dictates that all that ultimately matters is matter. What matters in your life? Here's how you know what matters in your life. When you're deprived of it and you feel like you have a right to be a horse's hind in. Satan twisted God's words to defeat Adam and Eve, and he's going to do the same thing for you and I. He's going to do the same thing in you and I. He's going to... Poor theology leads to a lot of defeat. The, this name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a princess, I'm a prince, therefore I deserve this, 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 and this, and this. And if I don't get it, well, I'm angry with God and I'm angry with everybody around me. I've seen people utilize that theology in order to take advantage of other people, even fellow Christians, because they thought, I deserve this. Not right. Bad theology results in so much destruction in, in misery because if we're not feeling like we deserve everything, we, we turn around fall down and say, well, God must not love me because my life isn't going every way that I demand that it go. See, we're deprived of what we demand, and then we turn around and our, our relationship with God falters. Jesus Christ was deprived of food for 40 days, and his relationship with his Father was more important than all, when the food. Is everybody... For kind of tracking with me where I'm going with this? By the way, the devil still uses the same trick today, and again, it's because we roll over. <laughs> same lies he told, to, he told to Adam and Eve. You're special. You're different. It doesn't apply to you. Hell yeah. Know all about that. Because it works, but guess what? It didn't work on Jesus. It did not work on Jesus. Imagine that was a frustrating day for Satan. I like to say that. He needs more frustrating days, doesn't he? 
One more point before we read. I heard a preacher out uh, online point this out. This is interesting, and we kind of talked about that this morning in Sunday school class, which was really cool, the way the Holy Spirit was bringing those things together. The devil, we, we think the devil just wants you to steal the candy. So then he can go, ha, 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 you stole the candy. There, he's so nasty that there may be some element of just taking joy in seeing wickedness. I wouldn't be surprised. The devil likes to see people at war with each other, hating one another, bitter. Oh, yeah, that's, that's all true. But the devil really isn't interested in making you sin. That's just, that's just something he uses to get to what he's really at. That's not what really motivates him. He wants you to sin because that drives a wedge between you and God. That's kind of what we were talking about in Sunday school class today. He doesn't want you and the Lord to have a good relationship with each other. And that's what Satan tries to do with Jesus. So let's look now in Luke chapter 4, 1 through 13. Luke chapter 4, 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, so we see again uh, elements of the Trinity here, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led. So he was, he was just baptized. And he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Now, listen, brothers and sisters, there's something to us, again, because of bad theology, and I've been there myself. Brothers and sisters, I just got baptized for goodness sakes. Shouldn't my life be going well? I just started going back to church for goodness sakes. Shouldn't my life be going well? I just, I just gave away all my money and then God does this to me. Shouldn't my life be going well? I, you know, I just led somebody to Christ and then now I get this bad news? Jesus was just baptized, a good thing. God says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit sends him out to the wilderness. Come on, God. Have you ever been out in the wilderness and you feel like God can't be in it? I should not be in the wilderness. This is a dry place. This is a lonely place. I'm suffering here. The Bible says that God brought Jesus out into the wilderness. And for 40 days, he didn't have food. I just... I've just started to get my life back together, and everything's fallen apart. And on top of it, the devil comes to tempt Jesus. And we already know the way God operates, right? We saw Job, right? And then, and then Jesus tells his disciples, the devil wants to sift you. He wants to mess you over. Good thing you're with me, Jesus. Stop him. And Jesus says, and I asked the Father to help you stand strong while you're being messed over by Satan. What? God, why don't you think more like me? Because I like the easy button. And God is more interested about growing our faith. And sometimes our faith grows the most in the wilderness. I don't like that. It's the rich reality. Oftentimes when everything's going our way, I want, here's, here's the kind of person I am. And I'm doing way too much confession today. <laughs> you guys are going to think I'm nasty, but I know you. <laughs> Here's the kind of guy I am. I want to be so blessed. And I want all you guys to be so blessed, because if you're not blessed, I'm not happy. You know how that goes. I want everybody to be so blessed that we don't even need God anymore. Isn't that the problem with riches, Jesus said? <coughs> Wealthy man forgets he needs God. Hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> you ever feel like, I'd like to be so blessed that I don't need to pray so much. Lord, help me with this. No, I'd, I'd rather just avoid the needing help. Our faith often grows in the wilderness. Jesus, taken out in the wilderness right after his baptism, and the devil tries to mess him over, and he's got no food. Come on, God, if you want me to resist temptation, I need my four, I need my, I said four squares, didn't I? I need my three squares. Now, you guys are learning more about me all the time. <coughs> yeah. The devil, no, no, see, he ate nothing during those days. At the end of 40 days, he was hungry. Isn't that a funny line? At the end of them, he was hungry. I think I'd have been hungry about in the first seven, eight hours usually. The devil said to him, by the way, 
Uh, Aaron, I fast every single day, and I love to break fast in the morning. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Now, I always thought that was just a, a physical temptation because he's hungry, but it's also an intellectual temptation. He's, he's saying, God, prove yourself, and here's the way you're going to prove yourself. And people do that all the time today. If there's a God, then he would do this. If there's a God, then he would behave according to my tests. So that's the same test that's been going on forever. Uh, and Jesus answered him, it is written, people do not live on bread alone. Isn't that interesting? More than your trial, more than the tornado taking you home, more than the illness that you heard from the doctor that you didn't want to hear, more than the bills that are piling up, people do not live on bread alone. We need, we need God in our lives. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. So all over the world he's revealing this. And maybe, there's debate among theologians if the devil really knew what Jesus was up to. If he, was, if he knew he was going to die for our sins, uh, he may have been confused that the devil maybe didn't understand fully or maybe he did, but he, he knows that God loves people. And Satan says, you know, this is all mine. I can give it to you if you want. Just do things my way. I will give you all the authority and their splendor. It was given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. How many people on Wall Street, how many people in Hollywood, how many times in our own lives have we been tempted? Oh, yeah. Push God aside. Live for this. Pastor, I can't come to church anymore because they're paying me $1.50 an hour more to work on Sundays. Oh, and is this going to work out for you, spiritually? Satan said, Satan said, worship me. You can have it all. Yeah, I want it all. I still don't have a flat screen TV yet. That kind of, you know, you can have a flat screen TV if you don't tithe. Oh, <laughs> is that how that works? Satan says, if you worship me, it will all be yours. Ever, anybody think that they've ever heard that before? You ever hear that before? Satan says, if you cut some corners, lie a little bit, cheat this person, don't do this, don't do that, don't do what God wants to do, you'll make it, you'll pull ahead in life, you'll get everything you want. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And brothers and sisters, let's serve God only. We're not going to live for the almighty dollar. We're not going to live just to be popular with people. We're not going we're, we're to do any of all of these things that could take us away from serving God. Is it too hot in here, or can we, can we say amen for that? Amen. We're going to live for God. Jesus said, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led uh, uh, him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. I did not know this. I learned studying this week that there was a Jewish... Uh, thought going all, all around in the intertestamental period that King Herod's temple, that when the Messiah comes, he will reveal himself by standing on top of the temple. Then everybody will know, oh, he's the Messiah. So the devil is not just sitting around in hell thinking of things. He's aware of pop culture. He's aware of what the Jewish people were saying. And so he said, uh, he took Jesus on top of the, the temple. If you are the son of God, do something dramatic. If you as a son of God throw yourself down from here because it's written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift up their hands <coughs> excuse me, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him. And then I don't like the rest of the sentence until an opportune time. Yeah, it's, it's an unending battle. Yeah, you, you, you were in the argument with your wife, and you bit your tongue. You were going to let your husband have it, but you, no, this is not going to serve God. I'm not going to say this. Guess what? You, you pleased God in that moment. Ten minutes later, 15 minutes later, a day later, maybe it's two weeks, who knows? you got to win again. <laughs> Otherwise, we're pleasing Satan because he's always looking for an opportune moment. Well, I'm frustrated. Therefore, I have a right to. Well, I... I I'm tired, therefore I have a right to. I'm hungry, therefore I have a right to. 
I'm sad. Everything's been going against me. Therefore, I have a right to. And we give ourselves a right to be instruments of Satan instead of instruments of blessing in our, in our lives, in our families, and in our church. There's two choices. Who wants to be an instrument of curse, cursing to everybody around them? Who wants to be a blessing? Not just God bless me, but I want to be a blessing to you, and we want to be a blessing to one another. Amen? Amen. We have to choose the Lord then. We have to resist Satan. We have to choose the Lord in how many times? Again and again and again and again. Okay, let me take a quick rabbit trail. In, it is hot and humid, and you've got to work with me. Uh, there, well, you don't have to, but there's always more blessings at church than at home, and there's more blessings if you stay awake than if you go to sleep. So you've got to work with me if you want the full complement of blessing. Okay, let's take this rabbit trail, little detour. <coughs> And then we'll get back to close on the meat of the passage. Verse 2 says, For 40 days, being tempted by the devil, he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. Does anybody really believe that Jesus didn't become hungry until after 40 days? Can the, does the Bible lie to us? Does anybody really believe that Jesus didn't become hungry until after 40 days? Because it says he ate nothing during those days. When they ended, he became hungry. So does that mean Jesus really wasn't facing a trial? It was easy for him because he wasn't hungry. Well, that seems to make the text out to be false. So does this mean the Bible lied if he was hungry before that? Listen, this is doing violence to the scriptures. This is reading the Bible in a way we do not read any other book. If people approached other books and tried to say that, People would look at them like they're crazy. Yet this type of violence, certain non-believers and certain Christians do this to the Bible all the time. And I want to teach us how to read and understand our Bibles. And that level of interpretation by saying, he did not become hungry until those days it ended. It means he was not hungry. But yet that contradicts the whole purpose of being in the wilderness for those 40 days. Trying to bring this kind of literalism to the text actually it does violence to the text itself. Non-believers will say, maybe not of this passage, but I'm using it as an example. See, the Bible is obviously wrong because no one would not be hungry for 40 days and then suddenly become hungry right after. And so then some Christians who, who buy into this crazy mindset will say, no, 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 he had power of God, so he wasn't hungry because the Bible said. And then similarly, some Christians might say in their well-meaning, God has chosen each word of the Bible specifically. He would not have chosen the word after unless it specifically meant that he was not at all hungry during the time of the fast. So it really wasn't a fast because he didn't feel that he was denying or sacrificing anything. Well, that kind of makes a lie out of the text, doesn't it? It would be like me saying, listen, well, about that time after 40 days, Jesus became mighty hungry. And then you telling me, so on your word, you have just declared that Jesus wasn't hungry, and after 40 days, uh, we're finished, he became hungry. Really? Was that what I was saying? After 40 days, he was mighty hungry. No. Don't do that to my words. Don't do that to Scripture. Sometimes it's possible to be so linguistically literalist about individual words that you miss the literal meaning of the passage. And I am worked up about this because, again, bad theology leads to bad conclusions. You cannot take one word out and in, in put so much literal interpretation on that you miss the literal meaning of this sentence. You will miss the literal meaning of the passage. Brothers and sisters, let's, let's, let's let the atheists do violence to the scriptures. We don't need to do their job for them. A famous example of this comes from Mark. Jesus said in Mark 13, 2, He's walking through the temple complex. He says, do you see all these great buildings? Jesus replied, not one stone will be left on another one. Every one will be thrown down. I believe that that was literally answered, don't you? If you want to say, well, this proves Jesus was not a prophet because the Bible says the prophet's words will come true because there were still piles of stones. The wall came down, but there were still some stones on top of that wall. You are being a linguistic literalist and you are doing violence to the text and you wouldn't do that with any other book. How, how come so many so-called atheists treat the Bible like it's a magic book? This book is magic, therefore I can make it do things I could not possibly do with my own writing or anybody else's writing. 
When Jesus said that none of these great buildings will stand, not one stone, will be, he was using hyperbole. He's saying this is going to be utterly destroyed. We know what he meant. Everybody, come off it. You know what he meant. He's saying is everything is going to be utterly destroyed. He was not saying that God's going to spread out all the rocks so that two or three rocks are not piled on top of each other. He was not saying that, and don't make the text say that. It's, it's totally ridiculous and unfair, and for some reason, Christians do this, and, and it's, it's silly. It's silly when atheists do it, but it's sad when Christians do this to the text. Uh, some people say, obviously, God would have known that the Wailing Wall would still be standing in Jerusalem in 2015, or that many massive stones would still be stacked on top of each other. Some of the biggest stones in the entire ancient Roman world are still standing there. Or a Christian linguistic literalist might be tempted to say, well, this must be a prophecy that's still going to happen because Jesus would not have said one stone on top of another unless he literally meant it to happen. And see how messed up taking each word literally can be. We end up missing the literal intent of the passage. Jesus was clearly saying, see these big, beautiful buildings everyone is so proud of? They will be completely destroyed. Brothers and sisters, that's the literal meaning of the text. Not, he's not... The focus should not be on one stone on top of another stone. And that's why every reasonable person would have understood him at that time. So, very, so that very early Christians saw the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Remember Jesus died somewhere around 30, 32, 30, somewhere around there. Everybody saw the destruction of the temple as the fulfillment of Christ's words. Nobody said, uh-oh, there's two rocks on top of each other, therefore Christ is a liar. Nobody said that. Even modern enemies of Christianity understand that the text, what the text is saying because when they assert that it could not possibly be Christ's real words somewhere around 30 AD because he, would not, he could have not have known what would happen 40 years later. See that? People say Christ couldn't have said this 40 years before the destruction of the temple because they know, that proves that they know that this text is saying it's utter destruction of the buildings. It's not about stones being stacked on top of each other. You guys are thinking I'm harping about this, but I watch you guys. You guys do this. Don't do this. Don't, be, uh, don't uh, make each word so literal that you miss the, the intent of the passage. So here's the lesson, brothers and sisters. When you study the Bible, be aware that you can actually miss the literal intent of a passage by interpreting each word individually in a hyper-literal sense, and you're going to miss out on what God intended for us. Okay. I wanted to go down that trail. Trust me. It is important, and try to keep that in mind when you're inter interpreting your scriptures. Now let's head back to Luke chapter 4. Again, this is more than just a tutorial on how to combat temptation, although it is that. Jesus versus Satan. Uh, remember what Ravi, Ze Ravi Zechariah said? Materialism dictates that all that ultimately matters is matter. For Jesus, this was not true, not ever, not maybe, not anywhere, not at all. And that's why Jesus didn't cave into flesh or Satan because he was on a mission of love. Brothers and sisters, are you on a mission of love? Do you have a purpose? Every, men, every member, a minister, every, every Christian, a, a part of the priesthood of the Lord, every family on, on mission, have you been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ? Then you belong to Jesus Christ. His mission is now your mission. And this is one of the ways we keep, defeat Satan in our lives. This is one of the ways that we uh, keep him from destroying our families, just taking our children away from the Lord, uh, breaking up our churches. You know how? I no longer live for myself. I live for Jesus. And I don't want to give the devil a victory in my church. I don't want to give the devil a victory in my family. I don't want to give the devil a victory in my life because I'm on mission. I'm on a mission of love. Jesus Christ kept his mission in front of him, and it was way more important to him than self-gratification. In other words, I love the Father more than I love my next meal. Let that be true of us, Lord. Please, Father, let that be true of us because we're so weak when we don't get those meals. We're so weak when we look at the bank account and there's just not enough in there and the bills are piling up. Lord, we're so weak when, when we had dreams and we had hopes and they're not going our way, Lord. And I have to say, Lord, you are sufficient for me. When, when this ailment doesn't go away, even though I prayed, Lord, you are sufficient. You're everything for me. Because Jesus looks at us and says, aren't I enough? Aren't I enough for you? You need all these other things? Jesus did not cave into the flesh because he had this mission. He had this love for God. Brothers and sisters, let's love God so much that when things don't go our way, it's not going to allow us to be tools of Satan. Isn't that kind of even ridiculous? 
And yet, raise your hand. I mean, you don't have to, but we've all been there, right? Tool of Satan. Jesus doesn't just want to love us. He wants you and I to respond to his love with love in a love relationship. You're called to love God. There's a trillion galaxies out there with an average of a trillion stars in each galaxy. That God loves you, and that God actually desires your love in response. You were called to be in relationship with the Father. Isn't that beautiful? With the Son, with the Holy Spirit. God loves you. Live like you know it. <laughs> Live like you know it. Don't be walking around in, in defeat. Don't be walking around with all your hope and your joy and your peace stolen. I'm talking to myself. I want to know that Jesus loves me, and I want others to know that he loves me by the way I live my life. And I want to love him more than I love food, because I love food a lot. <laughs> he wants us to love him more than power, more than wealth. And by the way, you can see uh, the different temptations. Some of them had to do with popularity. Some would do with test. You can go through there and do that on your own. Uh, he wants us to love him more than popularity or fame. Jesus rejected all of these things. He rejected the, the easy way out. Re Jesus rejected all of these things. Why? For you and me. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.